It's a dark novel, a bit disturbing, a bit thought-provoking. It is to some degree auto-fictional in that much of the action takes place in a fictitious North Devon village, rather like the one that we're sat in at the moment. My protagonist is a failed entrepreneur who has suffered a nervous breakdown, returned to the family second home in Devon, uh, and he becomes a bit of a recluse, a bit of a pariah, um, and uh, for 20 years or so he leads a very solitary life, uh, just sort of going out at night and and um, convening with nature and learning all about the countryside uh, and also about the folklore of the countryside as well. That's quite a big part of it. This is a book here all about the Green Man. Uh, there's quite a few books written on him. This is one of the best from John Matthews, who has a very sound knowledge of uh, English folklore. And he's written a poem here that's, um, that reflects, I think, uh, a lot of things that I'm trying to say in the novel. Under the green woods I walk alone. Once all the fields were mine, and the trees were mine, the hills, the spired coppices, the straight drills. Now I must share them. With tractor stink, with harvest slasher, but I still find ways to slip the seeds back into the furrow, to watch them grow, remembered or forgot. And still I am the green man, and still I walk the fields. And though the land seems empty, it's filled with life. And though I am forgotten, I still remember, and I still observe. Uh, the Green Man was a sort of a spirit of the wood, really, and was about regeneration of nature, I think. Uh, but indeed, he can be all things to all men. You see images of green men all over the place, particularly on churches carved into the roofs and bench ends of churches. So he is a very important figure, and there's variations on the theme as well. There's a lot of different myths about him. So he's, he's very important in English folklore, I think. Interestingly, with the folklore, that was really what concentrated my mind into the Nipton villages in North Devon. Nipton, or Nimit, means sacred grove, and in King's Nipton Church, for example, there are a lot of green men in the carvings of the roof bosses, and the green man is, is really a, a focus of English country folklore. So that's what concentrated my mind on that aspect of the plot. My protagonist uncovers an ancient festival that was conducted in the village since time immemorial. And something happened about 500 years ago to spoil this festival for everyone. There was a bit of an event out there in the woods when something went terribly wrong. And, and after that, the festival sort of went underground and nobody would really talk about it and it was just a festival for one or two village families to engage in because they felt they had to, I think, because of all the superstitions and all the myths. They just were hedging their bets, I guess, that they had to keep their gods happy. He tries to find out as much as he can about it. He's just very intrigued about it and uh, to the point that he uh, considers reenacting the festival himself. But that also goes unexpectedly terribly wrong as well. Well, some would say there's quite a lot of me in him. Um, I have to say he looks a little bit like me on the front cover of the paperback. And some of the incidents, I guess, are based on things that have happened to me. 
in the past. But he doesn't have many redeeming features, this guy, and I'd like to think that in that respect he isn't bloody at all. <laughs> Smoke Black and Thatch was the source of my inspiration, really, <coughs> and um, it, it's something that English Heritage get quite excited about. In North Devon, in particular, we have a huge number of very, very ancient thatched cottages and farmhouses, and quite often, if you break through into the roof void, you will find that um, there is smoke blackened thatch there, and that will tell you instantly something about the house. It'll tell you, for example, that it's been continuously occupied for 500 years or more. What they used to do, they used to thatch the house originally, and then every time it needed rethatching, uh, they'd only strip a little bit off, but they'd leave the inner layer on, and so the thickness sort of built up over a period of time. And then what it means is basically that the inner layer of thatch is the original one that was put on five or six hundred years ago. And it was at a time, of course, when there were no chimneys in the cottages. The hearth was simply in the middle of the floor, and uh, the smoke permeated up into the roof to try to get out. And it, um, and it blackened the thatch, so you know for sure that your house used to be a whole house with a fire in the middle. My protagonist buys a house uh, whilst he's still living in the Midlands that he, um, he rather hopes has got the blackened thatch into it. And, and as soon as he's taken occupation of it, he climbs up into the roof void and discovers that that is indeed the case. And he discovers something in the roof void that he knows for sure has been there 500 years because it's actually smoke blackened and when he takes it out it leaves a shadow behind it. So he knows for sure that someone hid it before the chimney was put into the, um, into the cottage, uh, which must have been about 500 years ago. And so he has this artifact and that the, the story weaves around the artifact and what it reveals about uh, the way that people thought 500 years ago. Shall I spell it out to you why it's so sought after, this smoke blackened thatch? If smoke permeates through a thatched roof, it leaves its mark on the tim timbers and on the thatch. Smoke blackened timbers are to a penny, so although desirable, aren't particularly rare. But to have smoke blackened thatch means that you know for sure that the lower layers of thatch have never been replaced and that the wheat in your roof was the same wheat that late medieval peasants stooped up in their fields 500 years ago or more when there were no tractors or even smartphones that's amazing isn't it it also tells you that your house has been in continual occupation for all that time 25 or so generations of ordinary families have lived their lives to the background of these walls and roofs. Each time the roof needed rethatching, another layer was added, making it thicker and thicker and preserving, like a sedimentary substrate, the echoes of these people's lives. I discovered uh, in my farmhouse smoke black and thatch in exactly the, the same way as my protagonist did. I just, um, I just pushed a hole through the ceiling, shone a torch on it, and there it was. So my, my farmhouse is very original, has a lot of original features in it, and um, it was easy for me to see that no one had been up there. There was no access to the roof void, and what I was looking at when I poked my head through and shone my torch around was exactly the same as the person who sealed it up 500 years ago uh, saw. Uh, coat with long sleeves um, it is actually a biblical mistranslation that I learned about at school from my religious education teacher. And um, in the Bible, Joseph's coat of many colours should actually have been translated coat with long sleeves. And when your coat had long sleeves, um, it just meant that you couldn't do any work, basically. And that was the idea of describing Joseph as having his coat with long sleeves. And in the story, the protagonist um, acquires a coat with long sleeves from his grandfather, he inherits it from his grandfather, and it's that coat that he wears all the time when he's lurking around at night in the woods, and, uh, and he, it conceals him 
uh, from other people. He's a bit of a creepy guy, but uh, uh, there is some lighter moments. He does have his he does have his more pleasant side. He is an interesting guy. Well, I think it should be aimed at anyone who um, enjoys thinking hard about issues. Basically, it raises a lot of issues that um, that I'm just hoping my readers are going to sit down and, and ponder about. So I think it is the thinking man's mystery.